Okay, here we are on the 5th of May, 2023, and today is the exact midpoint between spring equinox and the summer solstice. So it's the actual cross-quarter festival moment of Beltane. Uh, it also happens to be a full moon and a full moon eclipse. So it's a rather pokey day, as my friends, psychic questing friends would say, They'd call it pokey potent. Um, <clears throat> so today we transition from the days of oak to the days of holly. And um, traditionally in a lot of uh, May Day ceremonies or Beltane rituals, the oak king is triumphant over the holly king. Uh, that's a common story. And, and the, the oak king is going to win the hand of the May Queen, the Hawthorne goddess. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, I'm just going to bring up the PowerPoint, but we are focusing, as usual, on uh, medicine. But Holly does have some really interesting patterns. Where's that? Okay, <clears throat> so holly, or more specifically, Ilex aquifolium, which is the common holly or the European holly. I didn't realize, but there's about 570 different species of Ilex. So specifically, we're talking about this one, Ilex aquifolium, the common holly. Um, now, when I've talked about this before, when I first discovered the Owen Grove patterns, um, the, one of the first things that really jumped out at me was, such as someone's just turned up late, uh, was the pattern that at Beltane, oak and holly were side by side, you know? And at first, I was a little bit disappointed because I wanted holly to correspond with the wintertime rather than May, you know? Um, kind of thought of holly as the winter king. And it is that, but it's also in the Oem here at Beltane to battle with the oak king. And I'm going to go through some of the patterns of that shortly. Now, um, because I let someone in, it interferes with the PowerPoint presentation. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. So I took this photograph today uh, and the next few photographs. Now, one of the amazing things that happens with the days of holly being right now rather than the midwinter is that during the days of holly, holly blossoms and the tiny little, tiny, tiny little blossoms, they're about four millimeters wide and generally they're four petaled. So again, these are photos from this morning. Most of the time that they are four petaled. And I noticed recently on Facebook, someone had taken photos and there was a five petaled one. So it does seem to happen. This one here seems to be five petaled, but generally speaking, it's always four petaled um, with, the odd exception here again, here and there. Maybe that's like a the lucky four-leafed clover. It's just one of those random things that happens from time to time. But generally speaking, the holly blossoms are four-petaled. And this is my hand. So it just puts it in perspective how small these blossoms are. They're tiny and they're often overlooked, of course, you know, but 
people recognize holly having bright red berries. Of course, if there's berries, there has to have been a flower and the flower is there, but it's so small and hidden, it gets overlooked. Now the holly trees, <clears throat> there's a, a male holly and a female holly, and only the female hollies have the berries. They both have blossoms, and it's bees. We were talking about bees earlier, but it was it's bees that pollinate holly trees. Um, so between the male blossoms and the females, um, that's when the fruit comes from that pollination by the bees. So here's a chart of the fire festivals. And you'll see that in the bottom right hand corner, uh, oak and holly side by side, and the line between them is Beltane. So this is the traditional sequence of trees as given in the Book of Ballymote, the Oracet Nanises, uh, which dates to about 1390 AD. So all I've done is put them in a circle rather than line them out in a straight line. You know, make, making a circle is the most organic and natural thing to do. And when you do that, um, you've got a year wheel corresponding like this. You know, so in bulk was between Rowan and Alder, for instance. So Beltane, between Oak and Holly, and there's centuries of English folklore of Oak King, Holly King battling at May Day. So I call this the Beltane Three. So the Akma Uatha begins with Hawthorne. It's the first tree of the second Akma. And she's kind of the figurehead, if you like. She's the May Queen, although she hasn't usually opened up her flowers yet, but she is the kind of love interest or heart's desire of the consorts that are going to battle at Beltane, played out in English folklore anyway. And it's interesting that all three are side by side. Now, within that idea of Oak King and Holly King, is that one is a deciduous tree. That is, it drops its leaves in the autumn, the oak, and so symbolically it dies. Whereas the holly symbolically is evergreen. So it's symbolically immortal. It doesn't drop its leaves, it lives on. So although the oak king wins the flower goddess at Beltane the first day of summer, He's only a summer king, you know, he will, his reign will end at Samhain and the winter, winter king will be back or the evergreen king will be back. And that's played out in folklore stories, which I'll talk about briefly. Here's a nice little bit of uh, magic, if you like. So this is my oak stake and my holly stake. Each stake is 15 inches long. And the oak stake is made of oak and the holly stake is made of holly. And I've decorated them with the red bull and the white heart, the white stag. They're ancient symbols that go back to Canunus, uh, Iron Age Celtic things. And in between them, there's some hawthorn. So this is at Glastonbury Tor and the hawthorn blossoms from the base of the tor, where there are actually white hawthorn and also a pink Hawthorn. So I've got blossom of both there. So there's a bit of white and pink, two types of hawthorn there. But the reason I did this here is because Glastonbury Tor is on a great big alignment from St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall up through the Standing Stones of Avebury and onwards. But not only is it on that alignment, the alignment points to sunrise at Beltane. So my stakes are opening a Beltane gateway, just like they do in the Owen Grove, you know? So it's a way of playing with Owen magic in the landscape, if you like, you know, opening a portal between two trees. That portal is quite interesting further on. So another pattern then for Holly is that 
it's part of the evergreen pentagram and it's actually the first of the evergreens because the, there's only four in the oem the fifth one is willow tree but there are only four evergreen trees so because the willow tree isn't evergreen it's deciduous it drops its leaves if you start at winter solstice and draw a pentagram by having your finger at 12 o'clock and coming down to start your pentagram, you come to Holly first. And also numerically from Birch, Rowan, and Alder and so on. So Holly is the first evergreen tree to make an appearance in the sequence of the Oum. And very interesting. Here too then, so this diagonal line between Beltane and Sawain, okay, uh, the full moon, like today's a full moon, the full moon is always opposite wherever the sun is. So if the sun was in oak, the full moon would be in gorse because it's directly opposite the sun, reflecting all of the sunlight. And if it was, if the sun was in holly, the full moon would be in heather, you know, but today we're actually on the cusp between oak and holly. So we're actually on that Beltane Sawain cusp. So today's full moon is uniquely not only in eclipse, but it's in between gorse and heather right now. So that's a really strange liminal in between places kind of full moon that we've got going on. But it also means that although I was initially disappointed that Holly wasn't in position to be the winter king, like it wasn't at winter solstice, for instance, something more magical happens. Once you get to Sawain, and you from, from Sawain onwards, you're in the days of Heather. So when the sun's in Heather after Sawain, that full moon is a holly moon because the full moon is always opposite. So the full moon after Samhain is a holly moon. So there's really interesting patterns there um, of holly that wouldn't be there if it was just the winter solstice, you know, and actually the yew tree is winter solstice opposite apple. And there's a whole lot of really important things with that. <clears throat> so holly where it is incredibly unique it's in the perfect position to battle the oak king it's the first evergreen of the evergreen pentagram and it means that the full moon after Samhain is a holly moon or by chance you know this is just the tree sequence from 1390 AD so um there's a lot, like I said, there's lots of folklore traditions in England that happen around May Day, Maypole dancing and so on. But going back to the medieval times and the stories of King Arthur and his knights at the round table, I would argue, and there's tons of evidence for it, but it's too much to go into, that a lot of the stories in the Arthurian sagas are actually retellings or repackagings of ancient mystery tradition wisdom stories teaching stories you know that they were turned into romance at a time when you could literally be burnt for not being a catholic you know like the cathars in the south of france so lots of esoteric observations and esoteric teachings were wrapped up in story hidden in romance you know so it just becomes entertainment in the castle banqueting hall that the troubadour or the bard could tell this story and but inside that story there's profound esoteric ideas now uniquely to um fairy traditions and i would say underneath the fairy traditions there's a lot of witchcraft traditions and other world reality stuff is Sir Gawain. Of all of the knights at the round table, Gawain is uniquely to do with magical forests and fairy maidens and obscure esoteric lore. So 
one of them is quite famous story. I'm sure everyone's heard of it, which is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And that starts at winter time. It starts at Christmas time in the story. King Arthur's having a big banquet at Christmas time and everyone's sitting around the round table and enjoying themselves. And then this weird ghostly figure turns up at King Arthur's court. It's the Green Knight. And he's got green armor, green skin, green hair, green clothes. And he's very strange. And he's carrying, apart from a great big axe, he's carrying a holly bough. So his main symbol is this holly branch, you know, symbol of the Winter King, the immortal king who can't die. And he challenges King Arthur or any of his knights to a beheading game. Anyway, Gawain thinks it's a load of silliness and takes up the challenge. And the, basically the Green Knight says, you can chop off my head on condition that a year from now I can return the favour. Of course, it seems silly. So Gawain chops, his, chops the Green Knight's head off, thinking that would be the end of the story. But it's not. The, he's paranormal, this Green Knight, you know. After his head's been chopped off, he picks his head up and the head carries on talking and says to Gawain, right, I'll see you 12 months from now. You know, so this is a winter to winter, winter solstice to winter solstice, year wheel mystery by a figure carrying a holly branch, you know, and that carries on. But it, it's got this um, beheading game. And that's really important. This is this battle between oak king and holly king and the summer king or the oak king has to be beheaded has to die whereas the evergreen the immortal can't die so it's a kind of story version of some of these ideas now another story of gawain is called sir gawain and dame ragnell or the wedding of Sir Gawain and Dame Ragnall. And Dame Ragnall is a fairy woman who had been cursed to look like a loathsome hag, really monstrous and deformed. And the curse can only be broken if she can get Sir Gawain to agree to marry her. You know, so that's the kind of pantomime or soap opera of the story. Anyway, he goes through with it. He, he marries her. But when she first appears in the forest, now listen to this, she is sitting between an oak tree and a holly tree, just like the Owen Grove, where oak and holly are on either side of Beltane. That's where Dame Ragnall, as a deformed and ugly, monstrous, loathsome lady, is sitting between the oak and the holly. Uh, anyway... The wedding night happens, and in the bedroom, Gawain turns and looks at her, and she's suddenly stunningly beautiful. And she explains that she's had a magical curse put upon her by an evil stepmother, and that she can be beautiful at nighttime and deformed in the daytime, or she can be beautiful in the daytime and deformed at nighttime, and which would he prefer? And Gawain being the good knight, he says, you must decide. So he gives her sovereignty to make her own choices. And that breaks the spell completely. So she's beautiful all the time. But the interesting thing is that she was sitting between Oak and Holly. You know, she's she's kind of like the goddess of the land at Beltane waiting to be won, waiting to be married, you know. Now, uh, another bit before we move on, then, in the Arthurian stories, there are four magical, sacred items wrapped up in Christianity. So the Arthurian stories are written for a Christian audience, but they're ancient motifs. Now, Jesus is celebrated on the 25th of December, which is three days after the winter solstice. So you have winter solstice, three days standstill, and then it's the 24th or 20, 25th of December. So 
you know, it's not in the Bible anywhere, but 25th of December was given to Jesus as his birthday. So that makes him a winter king. He's a winter solstice king, you know, in medieval stories. And he has two magical items. He has the spear that pierced him in the side, and he has the cup that caught his blood, you know, the Holy Grail. So with Jesus, you get the spear and the cup. Now, what's often overlooked, that all of that spear and cup Jesus stuff is Percival's story, the story of the Holy Grail. It's all about Percival. But equally, running alongside that, there's the story of Gawain. You know, and Gawain has to find the sword that decapitated John the Baptist. It's called the Saracen's sword. You know, not politically correct, but this is medieval story. Um, so just like Jesus was given the 25th of December, John the Baptist is given 24th of June. So the summer solstice is the 20th or the 21st of June. Three days standstill takes you to the 24th of June. So for some reason, which isn't in the Bible at all, um, medieval mysticism made Jesus uh, winter solstice king and John the Baptist summer solstice king. And with John the Baptist, his magic items are a sword that cut his head off and the platter that his head was put upon. You know, so in the Welsh story, Herodur, the grail is a head on a platter. It's because of John the Baptist. It's a Johannite mystery there. But simplistically, after all of that, it's a winter king and a summer king. And the summer king, in the Christian version, John the Baptist gets decapitated. The, the summer king always gets finished, like John Barleycorn being cut down in the autumn time. So Gawain is playing with all of that imagery, really. You know, he fights the green knight who's got a holly bough and represents the evergreen. His love, who becomes his wife and the mother of his child, was sitting between an oak tree and a holly tree. And then he has to find the magic sword that decapitated John the Baptist. Really interesting. It all gets overlooked in favour of Sir Percival and the Grail. And a final bit of interest, thinking that holly is the um, uh, part of the evergreen the pentagram. Traditionally, the shield of Sir Gawain is the pentagram. So it really intrigues me. There's something in the story of Gawain, and he could be a distortion of Gwyneth Neath. Go in, go in, same sort of thing. Um, but yeah, interesting night of the round table with intrigues that tie in with the Oem circle in the Oem year wheel. All that aside then, so holly as a medicine. <clears throat> Where's my notes? So... Um, before we start, the berries are toxic, of course. The berries are not edible. They can be used, or they they did get used in old days as a purgative. So if you wanted to create vomiting for some reason or other to maybe get rid of something else in the stomach, the berries could help with that. They're going to make you throw up. Um, I don't think they're deadly poisonous, but then who would want to find out? So the medicine from the holly is primarily the leaf and the leaf can be drunk as a tea, as an infusion, you know, so you can have holly leaf tea. And the, the properties of that, um, it contains caffeine like regular tea, but holly leaf tea is good for fevers, joint pain, rheumatism, swellings, water retention mainly it's used for any chesty congestions so like catarrh or pleurisy uh, drinking holly tea uh, holly leaf tea can help with chest conditions 
Um, also, um, it has the fresh leaves have been juiced, and as a juice, they help to um, help people suffering with jaundice somehow. Um, but it has to be the juice of the fresh leaves. More interestingly, so that's about it. It's kind of minimal. It's not as giving uh, as many other trees in a kind of regular herbal way. It's really just you can drink the leaves as a tea and it helps with some things. Leave the berries alone. Um, but as a flower essence, um, it's right up there with the original uh, founder of flower essences, I guess, bark, the bark flower remedies. Um, Holly was very important, and I'm going to read what he says. I, uh, Rosemary's here, so she can give us her insights on it. <clears throat> but generally, it seems to help uh, help negate any feelings of anger or hatred you might have for other people. So it helps you just be compassionate and forgiving. Um, but what bark wrote himself, Dr. Bark of the Bark Flower Remedies. He said, Holly protects us from everything that is not universal love. And that Holly opens the heart and unites us with divine love. So as a herbal tea, it's kind of, um, what would you say, uh, not that inspiring really is just a, a kind of basic remedy but the, as a flower essence for one's psychology and one's emotional state it's right up there you know to dispel or hatred and anger that or you know all the wounds that you might have had from other people and that you've got grudges and stuff unresolved you know holly is going to help you just find peace and just let it all go and just, you know, go back to universal love. So that's quite interesting. So moving on from the holly tree itself and looking at the mushrooms, there's this one. There was only one that I could find that was unique to the holly tree. And it's amazingly small and tiny. And it's called the holly parachute mushroom. And it's so small and tiny. Look at those spikes of the holly leaf. That's how small they are. Um, that it has no function as an edible mushroom. There's no recipes for it. And it doesn't seem to have, been, have any medicinal. It's just so small. Um, certainly there's nothing online to say you can gather it and do this with it. You know, it's just... It's just interesting in itself, I think, that it's just so small and tiny and only grows on dead, moist holly leaves. The holly parachute mushroom. Incredible, tiny little thing. It's interesting that the holly blossoms are very, very tiny and its fungi is very, very tiny as well. So looking for a mushroom to relate to the holly, um, I chose this one, the horn of plenty mushroom, which is also known as the black trumpet mushroom. Now it's not unique to holly, but it grows in hardwood forests, which are oak, beech and holly, you know, so it's holly's part of the environment that the Horn of Plenty mushroom grows in. But the only mushroom unique to holly that I could find was the little parachute mushroom. So this one, I've, I hadn't heard of it until recently and I've never eaten it. It's completely edible. It doesn't look like it. It looks like it would be quite poisonous, um, but it it's a fully edible mushroom. Apparently it has a smoky flavor and like a lot of the mushrooms we've looked at, has a lot of health benefits, of course, as well. So the Horn of Plenty mushroom, the black trumpet mushroom, you can buy it 
online you can there's plenty of places where you can buy it so here on this packet you can see that just says black trumpet dried mushrooms but it's the same horn of plenty mushroom now <clears throat> many things it helps with of course so it can help restore the nervous system actually repair nerve endings so any neurological issues this is going to help on a cellular level with the nerves. Um, so it helps nervous disorders. It helps people that have the shakes because of bad nerves. It helps with depression. Uh, it rejuvenates the cells inside the body. It's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor. So it helps to reverse cancerous tumors as well. It's very high in vitamin B12, which is lacking in uh, vegetarian diets, you know, so unless you use supplements. So this is a natural food product that's going to have lots of vitamin B12 in it. It can stabilize blood sugar levels for people with type 2 diabetes. And as I mentioned, it can repair, repair the nervous system. So fascinating, you know, it's another one of these completely edible mushrooms that you don't see in the supermarket that has all sorts of, not just well-being, but actually restorative, actually helps cells regrow. You know, it's incredible what some of these mushrooms can do. And uh, I just wish, you know, I wish it was more in my diet and that's where I want the direction of my life to go. Um, yeah, it's a whole new lifestyle awareness thing of, you know, that old thing of let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. The fungus world, the mushroom world, you know, in English supermarkets, we pretty much see one, maybe two types of mushroom in the, in the grocery area. You know, you have your basic mushroom and then chestnut mushrooms. And then in a whole food shop, you might be able to get dried shiitake mushrooms or things like that. But anything else, you've got to send for it online. You know, it's not in a common supermarket at all. And yeah, it should be. It should be medicine. You know, and I think in like Native American and traditional Chinese medicine, all sorts of mushrooms are used. And, and the West is playing catch up. It was just learning. So the flower I chose for this time of year, uh, partly I was inspired by uh, the Roman goddess Flora. And the festival of Flora is Floralia, which runs from the 28th of April until the 3rd of May. So it encompasses May Day and all those kind of Beltane ideas. Um, so, you know, if Hawthorne is the May Queen, the love interest of Oak and Holly, then Flora is the goddess of flowers, albeit from Roman culture, but Britain, not Ireland, but Britain was Romanized for the best part of four centuries. So when we get to all the Welsh flower goddesses, you know, there has to be an influence from Flora, the flower goddess. Now, I can't prove any of that. They're just feelings that I have from research that I've done and research that I can, I'm interested in pursuing. Now, so Flora has her Floralia festival, 28th of April to the 3rd of May, but she also has one single day later in the month, which is a special day purely for the rose. And that's the 23rd of May is Rose Day. So that's why I chose the wild rose, the dog rose, you know, and it's been an important part of the British Isles, certainly for thousands of years. I don't know why it's not in the Owen, you know, uh, it's not in the original 20 trees. And yet they have found rose hips in Neolithic graves, you know. So the rose, the wild rose and the rose hips have been a big part of native Celtic British pharmacy. Um, now, 
I kind of feel that symbolically the rose is actually at the heart of everything. I, I, I would almost place the rose at the center of the grove rather than the perimeter. So like the 20 trees make the circumference or the perimeter. And what do you do in your sacred center? Well, that's unique to you and whatever your magic tells you to do, you know. But for me, the rose queen has to be there. And I'll talk about her at the end a little bit um, and why I think she's there. Uh, but so that's why I chose rose. And roughly in the days of Holly, uh, the wild rose uh, is going to start opening, um, certainly in Somerset, uh, along the hedge rows, the dog roses will start popping up uh, soon, certainly by June anyway. Um, so the wild rose then, commonly... Uh, The rose hips are the most common use herbally. But before we get to that, the petals are you can be used as well. Um, but you have to be careful about not harvesting too many petals because if you damage the flowers, then there's no rose hips in the autumn, you know. So be very mindful about not ruining the harvest fruits by taking too many petals. But the petals are mildly sedative, sedative um, they're antiseptic and they're anti-parasitic. But you need to gather a lot of rose petals to use that. So I, I'm kind of inclined to say, you know, just leave it alone and let's have the rose hips in the autumn sort of thing. But you can gather some of the blossoms and some people preserve the blossoms in honey or in mead you know, and so that you can use it as a medicine by preserving the essence, the, the properties of the petals. Uh, most powerfully, I suppose, is that um, the rose oil, I'll come to that shortly, but uh, the rose hips then are the main medicine from the wild rose. And during World War II in England, when there was food rationings and stuff. They encouraged people to harvest as many rose hips as possible. And that's when um, rose hip syrup became a big thing. And the vitamin C content of the rose hip is 30 times more than vitamin C from an orange. Incredibly powerful stash of vitamin C. So it was one of those things uh, really important to keep, you know, and, and of course you can take the hips, you can take the stones out of it and you can dry the hips so you can keep them all year round after the harvest and you can rehydrate, rehydrate them in your herbal teas. So um, apart from being very, very high in vitamin C, uh, they're antioxidant, and they're anti-inflammatory as well. So one of the wonderful things, of course, is rose oil. And, and a bit like flower essence, it's, the rose oil is not so much herbal medicine as a big emotional, psychological healing. You know, it, it has a reputation as being an aphrodisiac and a stimulant and stuff. But if you're broken hearted, uh, the smell of rose oil can can just bring you peace. You know, it heals the broken heart. You know, it, it is uh, the oil of love, if you like, you know, so you can use it for love things, but it will also just help a wounded heart find its own inner love for itself, which is kind of similar to what Dr. Bach was saying about Holly, like reconnecting with universal love and, and protecting you from anything that isn't universal love. And the rose oil itself is that, you know, it, it, it is the flower of love. It's the flower of Venus. 
um, very expensive to get good quality rose oil. No, but yeah, sure many people are, are aware of that anyway. So just to finish then, this is a painting, part of a painting I did years ago. And on the one hand, it's a painting of Ellen of the ways, but I deliberately put wild roses in her hair. Um, my friend Caroline Wise commissioned me to do the painting, and I think we discussed it and said she should have flowers in her hair. So she's got wild roses and ivy. And the reason there is that the idea of the goddess of the grove being Nematona, who as a kind of Celtic Hecate would correspond with the yew tree as the conclusion of the grove, but equally coming from winter solstice and starting a new sequence, her first expression is the birch tree and Ellen and so on. So to the right of her here behind her is birch tree. You know, like her, her totem tree, if you like. But theoretically, the divine feminine walks around the in the, the entire circumference of the grove, going from tree to tree, you know. So she comes to the second Akma and she is the May Queen, you know, and, and then she carries on and she'd be the apple queen at summer solstice and so on. So she's the ever-present goddess of nature, uh, the sovereignty goddess of the land, the flower goddess through the changing seasons. But that symbol of the rose, very, very important for many alchemical reasons as well. Um, we've talked about holly being part of the evergreen pentagram. Well, there's a second pentagram that interlaces with the evergreen pentagram, and that's the rose family pentagram, which is the apple and the hawthorn and the blackthorn and the rowan. You know, so it, the rose is present, even though the wild rose isn't in the sequence of trees. The rose queen, as Venus, as Dame Venus, is in the Oem with all of the pentagrams, all of the interlacing pentagrams and the hidden pentagrams, that barcode or that falling card of Venus is ever present. Um, there's a nice expression that she is the queen of every hive. Really worth thinking about that phrase, the queen of every hive. And, you know, in traditional sort of 16th century, maybe 15th century witchcraft, they, they would refer to Lady Elfheim, you know, Queen of the Fairies, and, and she's that as well. So she's the Queen of Every Hive, she's Dame Venus, she's Lady Elfheim, and maybe now with the insights from modern druidry and modern paganism, we would say Nematona or Ellen, you know, it's, that's the ever-present green woman or lady of nature, you know, but we, it wasn't recorded, but at the beginning of today's session, there was a lot of talk about bees and it was, I was quite happy to just hear it all because it, it summed up perfectly, you know, we're all the busy bees in the grove, in the hive, and she's the queen of the hive. You know, so the rose and uh, maybe, you know, I might do some sort of post on the 23rd of May to honor the Rose Queen in some way. But I do think she's ever present. So I'll shut that down. We can chat for a while. Uh, I'll keep recording until we do the meditation. But you can put your microphones on and talk about any of the presentation. Why is why is she wearing antlers uh it was for a book cover about the goddess ellen who was often depicted with antlers and it's can be traced back to ideas of a deer goddess in ancient europe uh, i would also argue that the antlers are a symbol of the winter and so another way of 
you know, so you've got Winter King and Summer King and their animal motifs are the bull and the stag. Now, the winter and the summer can also be a metaphor for mortal and immortal. So the summer half of the year represents the mortal life, the mortal incarnation, you know, and that's symbolized by the bull. And the, the winter half of the year is the immortal time of the year, but it's, you know, it, so the antlers represent the undying immortal god and goddess idea. So what would you say that may be like Oberon and Titania or the fairy lord and a fairy queen, you know, the lord and lady that are ever living. So their symbol would be the antlers because the winter is the undying time, whereas the summer everything gets cut down at harvest time. It's the, it's a mortal time. These are just ideas, not no dogma there, but I was just trying to explain her having antlers. Well, did I understand you say at one point that the reindeer or the caribou, which have been correlated with Nematona, are the only female deer that, that, that have antlers? Is that correct? Or did I misunderstand that? No, that's true. So I was just saying that the antlers themselves represent the winter time and the ever living spirit. Yeah. But, e but equally, from a, a natural history perspective, there is only one type of deer that has antlers, and that's the reindeer. And yeah. that, that reindeer law is old European law going back way before the Bronze Age, you know, when the last ice age melted and the, the first forests returned, um, yeah. which were birch trees and pine trees, the reindeer would create the first tracks in the virgin landscape. So Ellen, in many ways, becomes a figure for those first tracks, the ways across the land, or the a bit like Ganesh in Hinduism, you know, it's a way clearer. Um, marching out into brand new virgin landscapes kind of idea. What do you think about the idea of the balance between anima and animus as the beginning queen of the wheel? I mean... I've been, uh, Manor, I've been thinking about that a lot um, and I've written an essay about it for volume four of The Grove, the, an, oh. the, the anima and the... Well, you know, Carl Jung called it the anima and animus as the mm -hmm. the inner, ma inner man or woman of each person. But I've done it from a slightly different perspective. I've been talking about the individual's muse. So okay. your own your own muse would be your perfect idea of lord or lady, depending on your heart's desire. You know, um, so I've written about that, but I would put the like the final tarot card of the major arcana, the world, uh, I put the the muse, male or female, in the center of the grove, um, rather than the, the yew tree. There but you the, are. Yeah, so I, I see it as the very heart of the rose, rather than part of the circumference. Cool. But that's, again, no dogma, that's just how I'm playing with it at the moment. Well, I like Katma more than Dogma anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the volume four is all about the nine maidens, the nine muses, and I went off on a tangent thinking about the one muse inside everybody, your own muse as well, you know. Yeah, my temple's called the Temple of the Muse, and the reason why I chose that for my ICM was because I felt like um, as a priestess of Isis, I feel like really truly my my mission or my my life goal is not to tell someone what they need to do, but to clear the way for them to find their own magic and their own art. And to me, that's sort of the way 
the muse doesn't take credit and say, well, I'm the one that told Michelangelo to paint, you know, whatever. I mean, they just, that's just their job is to inspire others. And so um, I love it when people talk about the muse because the muses to me, particularly the nine muses are just very inspiring to me. And I, 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 I aspire <laughs> to be more of a muse than a priestess or an enchantress or whatever you want to call it. You know, I, I, I just want to inspire people to find their own path, you know. I think it's important. I, I do believe it's also important to study the old traditions and to keep them pure and to speak up when you see something that's like way off base, you know. Absolutely. But, you know, you know, that's just why I went to my temple that. <laughs> I'm with you on the muse part because we all have that innate sense that makes us create, makes us uh, and inspires us. And that's our own personal muse. I heard someone say the other day about your subconsciousness, your only real consciousness is you. You're the only one in there, right? <laughs> I agree. Yeah. So. And the goddess and the god, divinity. Yes. yes. I mean, in my, in my mind. But I'm spirit. I'm not speaking for everyone, but, you know, yeah. Spirit's in there. I've been, playing, I've been playing with the idea that your muse is your other half in the spirit world. Oh, I love that. Uh, and that, you know, your own middle cauldron, your own inner world, um, the voice there is them talking to you, you know, uh, and that in a way they're a compass so that you're following your heart's purpose, you're listening to your inner guidance, you know, and you're... It, yeah, you know your your middle cauldron and the spirit of that that lives there is your other half in the other world somehow. You know, I love that. No, and that's like in Tai Chi they refer to the three cauldrons or uh, yeah um, as the Dantian, and um, they you store your power there, but they never get to open the top one, which is what you want. You know, you want to be able to see in in all three cauldrons. Well, maybe that's our gift when we leave these mortal bodies that, that our top cauldron gets to open up and we get to see all those wonderful things that we wondered once that may or may be true, may or may not be true, you know? I mean, who knows? Who knows? Can only imagine... So, I mean, can you uh, be your guide? <laughs> I thought, it, I, I thought, oh, sorry, go on, go on, go on. I'll come back to you, Bridget. I was just going to say that, um, where, you know, for a lot of people that are new to the OM, and, you know, I was there myself, you know, that originally I just saw the, a pouch of twigs as a way of doing readings, like taking runes out of a pouch and doing a rune reading, that kind of thing. But it for me, it evolved into this grove idea and that that grove became a sanctuary in my visions, in my shamanic dreamings and stuff. And, and that became a very real inner world place to go to. Now, I, I consider that astral grove or astral temple to be inside my middle cauldron and and that then for me is the shamanic threshold for all of the inner journeys and inner work that i do you know and it's from that perspective that i feel like my muse is my other half in the other world you know that that they they're a constant companion and if you if we're peaceful enough you can hear your muse whispering mm -hmm. to you you know oh, and yeah. You know? And there is a hive mind there, you yeah. know, between the two of you. So that's very interesting. 
I'd love to read what what you've written there. Well, yes, again, no dogma, only catma. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's certainly exploring, you know, like what I think about with the 21st century, there's the, like Star Trek, there's the potential of uh, in exploring outer space, if you like, but also <laughs> it's got to become very normal and not strange that we all explore inner space, that we go into our psyche and our dreaming worlds and our dreaming realities mm. and stuff, you know? So mm. these are baby steps to what I think ancient indigenous people did naturally, mm. you know, that they interacted mm. with their inner world much better mm. than we do. And we're mm. just now catching up, right? Yeah, it's like we're shaking off amnesia or something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We're remembering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bridget. I love I love the holly uh, parachute. Yes. It, it said to me, sorry, Bridget, because I know you wanted to talk. No, no, it's okay. And yeah. it, it said it said to me that its relationship is with the leaf. <laughs> and <laughs> it's a really important relationship. And you said about the fact that I'd know, I don't really know the bark essences. I know him. I see him and I've spoken to him a few times, but I don't, I'm not really that familiar with his, but the holly leaf, the doctrine of signatures would be just that, that it's all spiky, spiky. And it's telling you that that's what it's good for. So when things are spiky, and not easy to go through, then it's telling you, I'm going to help you with that. And I don't have one, but I have, funnily enough, it's Jade Vine. And then the dog, then the dog rose is so delicate. And when you see it growing in amongst all the, it's just, it tells you about itself. It is amazing. It's resilient and it's like us. We're very delicate and dainty, but we're so resilient. And, you know, when one falls away, another one takes its place. And it's extraordinary, really. And I have used it in a bowl to wash the feet when I've been doing blessing ways for me to be. And I'm sorry to say that I have actually put the dog roses in there. I've gone out and collected some. Now you've told me that <laughs> the other <laughs> use for it, I feel a bit, mm. and the rose hip, I've got the rose hip as well. And it's all to do with, it goes through the winter protected by thorns until the delicate blooms to summer is lent. So it's like we're, we're protected until it's the right time to use it. And then, wow, no stopping us. Anyway, sorry, Bridget, because I interrupted you. Another quick observation on that is the holly. I don't know if people realise that the holly leaves are very prickly low down, Mm. but once they get higher up and they're no longer threatened by animals eating them, their leaves Mm -hmm. are smooth. So they're only prickly low down as a defensive thing. In some traditions, I'm sorry. In some traditions, I've heard it called the best in the fight. Because if you've ever tried getting through a holly bush, yeah. you know the holly bush will win. Sorry to interrupt. No, it's good. Bridget. Oh, uh, just a few things I've noticed, just to put a few things out there if anyone picks up on it. As well, just going on to the holly, the holly is spiky low down and not on the top. But that's also like a rose, isn't it? A rose has all the thorns and then it's a rose on top so it's very similar in a, in a way that the holly um is although it's a holly and not a rose it's 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 um it's patterning is very similar because it's spiky down below and on top and the rose is just the same as well hmm. and then i was looking at the word holly and holly's been the first evergreen of foot so this is the things i've put down holly's the first evergreen um of the five pentagram, there's five in the pentagram, but holly's the first true one. And then I was looking at the word holly is like the word holy. So, you know, that holy, holly, the similar thing. Um, but also you've got the um, George's cross. It's 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 the cross over, is it, um, 
you've got the, the cross of the four. So even though you've got the evergreen, it should have five with willow, and willow's a water tree. Um, so you've got the five, the four, and it's got four petals as well. So all the symbolism I can see there with the evergreen being four, and it start this bell chain starts everything. So even though the it's like it's to me it feels like the holly is allowing the oak to have its have its audience over summer, and then the holly obviously it, it comes back in again in the winter time, but it's having its audience in the summer, so it, it sort of hands it back over again. Um, so it hands it to oak in the summer, and then the evergreen carries on and it's the start of four it's got four petals sometimes five but then again that's the same as the evergreen it's four and the fifth isn't really one but it's kind of is one which is willow which is the water and I was, I was look, noticing that when you talked about Jesus and John so Jesus is the I'm, I'm trying to get my head around it Jesus is winter so he's the um, the immortal because it's winter a bit like the ivy is. John is summer, so he's like the oak, he's the mortal. And obviously John washes his Jesus' his feet, so he actually um, probably is the, the um, I'm not saying the original Jesus, but he's 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 actually washing, he's he, not washing his feet, he's actually baptising Jesus, isn't he? So he, yeah, so... There's John and Jesus together, the winter and the uh, summer. I was looking at the dates because you said 24th of the 6th for John. And then Jesus is round about 24th, 25th, the dates are picked on this calendar. Well, 24 is add the numbers together, it's 6. You've got a 6-6 six, six there, 24 and 6. But then in winter, you've got a 24 and a 12. So you've got two 24s, a double up 24, two, a double up 6. And then 12 is half of six. But that's like our clock, isn't it? We've got a 24-hour clock, a 12-hour year. So I'm just seeing this kind of playing out in our clocks and calendars somehow. You know, that, that, that the dates that have been chosen for all this. Mm -hmm. um, when I also looked at, and then you've got the shield of Gwen, well, the pentagram, I would see that as the rose. As, as, as Well, I just see it as a complete, the, cer the completion of the circle of, of life so it's that whole shield is to actually um it's it's like it's like the whole of the pentagram. It's, it's 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 everything that you're encompassing so it's both the mortal and the immortal which then takes me back to you and the middle cauldron which is the heart so it then goes back to holly holly is about the heart so we're talking now about it protects you what did i write down it's um it, Holly protects and opens the heart so of divine love with flowers. So we're going back to Holly, somehow having a connection to the middle cauldron. And then I saw um um this minute, um that was great, great. I don't quite understand the Gwen thing totally. Oh that was it, it was um the leaf, the little holly leaf with the mushrooms on. And I was looking at the macrocosmic world. And the the micro and the ma the micro and the macro. So as you were talking about the little um, mushrooms on the holly leaves, all I could see was was fairies. So it, it was like the, the smallest of smallest fairies on the holly leaves. So I just felt that even though those fair those mushrooms maybe aren't doing anything, even though we feel they're not doing anything for us, they're really connecting with the fairy realms. That's what I was picking up on as you were talking about it. So again, that goes into your your muse, doesn't it? If I'm if I'm round, um, what I'm picking up on is that your muse, you would talk to your muse through your middle cauldron, and it would connect you to your musing. But that would connect you to the holly because the mushrooms on the holly aren't anything physically going to um, aid you on anything. It's more about your your dream time, your mortal and immortal self, your 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 you know your your you're using your dream time that that connection with um that connection you know what i mean yeah. 
So that's what I was picking up on that. And then we've got dog flower. Well, the opposite of dog is God. So um, it was just like mirror, mirroring numbers. So we've got this 24 6, we've got this um, 6 6, we've got the 24 12, we've got the dog, the God. This is just like, yeah, yeah it could send you mental, couldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Bridget, the, beheading, the, the beheading, George George and the dragon. I don't, I don't understand yeah. why does it. A beheading in winter, so maybe you could actually. So I'm, I'm going on a bit here. Maybe yeah, you well, could also explain why you've got this beheading in the winter time. Because well, I'm, these are, I'm, I don't have the answers. I'm just that's just the medieval story. Um, but I'm going to have to cut it short because we've got to do our meditation and we're running out of time. <clears throat> but these oh, yeah, are... no, I've nothing else to say. I'm yeah. just putting some things out there about how yeah. how you've connected things together to make the O on, but I'm just seeing some connections here as yeah. well going on. Yeah. We can, we can use the Facebook group to talk about these things further, you know. Okay, but, okay. <clears throat> but right now, if we turn off the microphones and I'll stop recording mm -hmm. and we do the meditation. <clears throat> 